Welcome to my Rayman 3 fan remake devlog series. I invite you to join me as I talk about my journey of learning Unreal Engine and programming. I will go over how I made this blank scene turn into this. Come on, I'm kidding. Hey, I like that outfit on you. When does it come off? I'll be showing the models I've made, C++ code, and blueprint code. Alright, let's dive in. Episode 8, Player Combat Part 2. Come on, I'll show you something. So the logic is ready, now we can put in some visual flair. Let's start with the charging fist particle effect. So this is the charging fist effect. I make it start from this kind of purple color because I figured Rayman's purple. <laughs> so, And then it goes into orange and starts to glow white while it's fully charged. Also, as it's fully charged, we have these little sparks going inside. And we have the fist rotating at all times. So the fist is a single particle that gets spawned and it has this rotate around point node here to rotate in a circle. Now for the trail, it uses the same trail material as the Crab Ninja, except instead of being mapped to a plane, it's mapped to a cylinder. Here in the ribbon shape, I have a tube. Now the, two, the ribbon particles for the trail get spawned from the fist's location, so it indeed follows the fist. I have a scale ribbon width that scales with the emitter's age, so the tube is larger the more the fist is charged. And also have a second scale ribbon width to kind of enlarge the end of the trail. This kind of makes more of a vortex effect as without this, it's just something like this. Then the color nose changes the color from this purple to glowing orange. And I also use the dynamic material parameter to make it glow stronger. Just like we saw when we were going over the material for the crab enemy. Now the long sparks are a little too simple to go over I think, but really quickly they use the basic particle material. They get spawned on a sphere and I use a point attraction force to make them travel to the center of the particle effect. I guess one thing I do with the sparks that I haven't done before is I elongate them as they speed up and I use this by scaling the sprite size by speed. So the faster they go, the more scaled up they are in the y-axis. To make this work properly in the sprite renderer, you need to make the alignment velocity aligned. As for the projectile effect itself, this is what I got. This is what we would see if the if Rayman shot the fully charged fist. So kind of like two trails, one that's longer but thinner, and then there's another one that's larger. And there are also these embers that get left behind. I hope you can see them in the video. Now this particle effect has a user variable that I defined that takes in the fist's damage. So that was what the particle would look like if the fist's damage was equal to 3. But if, for example, we don't charge the fist at all, then the effect is much smaller. Then if I change it to, for example, 2, so it's like halfway, then it grows to match whatever the particle looked like when Raymond was charging his fist. So I don't think there's much point in going over the effect itself. It's the same trail material I've been using before, just layered a couple times on top to give it some more punch. And then the embers are just these tiny spots that get spawned and use a curl noise to move around. The only thing that's different is this user parameter I was talking about. It's called color scale. And here in the color of this trail nose, I have these curves that are driven by the color scale. So if the color scale is one, then we have the whatever color is in this spot over here. If color scale is 3, then we have whatever the color is over here in this spot. And in order to set that color scale value in Blueprint, what you need to do is there's this set Niagara by variable node. I was using a float. 
So here you just type in the na name of the variable. In my case, it's user color scale. So user dot color scale. And then here you can plug in the value. Okay, so let's check this out. If I just press the button, we have a nice purple trail. And as I start charging, the trail matches whatever the color was when Raymond start, stopped charging. We can go to max. There it is. I don't know if you noticed, I also added a camera shake for when Rayman uses max power. Adding a camera shake is super simple. You just put in a new blueprint class, search in camera shake. And here, once you select your shake pattern, you get all these settings like location shake, rotation, FOV, timing. And then to add it to blueprints, you just use play world camera shake. Select your camera shake you created, and that's pretty much it. The last thing I did regarding kind of the visuals of the punch is response to the terrain. So whenever the fist hits anything, I play this dirt particle effect and spawn this kind of fist decal on the wall. For the particle effect that spawns whenever the fist hits a wall, I reused the smoke and dirt particle systems from the Crab Ninja. For the decal itself, first I sculpted in Zipper something that kind of resembles three fingers going into a wall. Then I took the sculpt into Substance Painter to bake it on a flat plane and paint in the opacity. And then I made a decal material in Unreal Engine. I used a normal map of the fist. For the color, I just figured something white to match his fist's color is enough. So this decal kind of works with any surface. I also dimmed the opacity down a little bit so it's a little see-through. This also makes it work a little better with any surface. And then I plugged in this decal lifetime opacity. This allows us to change the decal's opacity and blueprint over its lifetime so it smoothly fades out instead of just disappearing. Now to set up the particle and the decal, I have this event, hit something event, that fires whenever the fist collides with anything. So first I spawn that particle system at the fist's location. I feed in the fist's damage again because I made this particle also grow in size if the damage is larger so a stronger fist makes more dirt and smoke and then for the decal there's a spawn decal at location node where i choose my fist decal i set the decal size to something that works for the location i also take the actor location and for the rotation i get the impact normal of the fist and flip it because otherwise the decal turns out to be inside out. And then I make a rotation from this vector to plug it into the spawn decal location. Then there's this set fade out node that makes the decal fade out smoothly. So after 20 seconds, it fades out for 10 seconds. And when it fades out, the decal gets destroyed. Okay, now I wanna go over making this target arrow. First, let's go over the widget blueprint. So we'll make the UI element and then we'll go over connecting it to the enemy crab, for example. So here in the designer, we got this arrow with the crosshair. I've taken the textures from the original game, just upscaled them a little bit. I added this pulsating animation because that was something that was there in the original game. And now let's go over the event graph. So there are kind of two things that I need to happen here. One is to rotate the arrow to be always pointing from Rayman to the target. And the other thing is to change the arrow to indicate to the player that he's gonna curve his fist if he shoots it now. And one other thing I have to deal with is I don't really like how the crosshair kind of seems to be shrinking down as I get closer to the enemy. This is something that Unreal does if I set the blueprint widget to screen. So I want to compensate for that and make it scale and make the UI element scale up depending on how close I am to the target. Okay, first things first, in event construct, I play the animation. If I set number of loops to zero, then it will loop indefinitely. And now let's get to the logic. 
So first I get the distance of the target to the player pawn. By the way, this is when I learned about blueprint interfaces and I started using them. I followed this tutorial to learn about them. But very briefly, so we're all on the same page, blueprint interfaces allow me, for example, to get some values that are on the BP player without casting to the BP player. So anyway, I get the distance from Rayman to his target. That is a variable that I have on Rayman. And I use this to scale up the circle. I have this simple function here that I made. This node over here is kind of the meat of the function. It divides one by the player distance to the target. So now if the player is very close to his target, so like 10 centimeters, then one divided by 10 will be 0.1. But if Rayman is, for example, 500 centimeters from the target, then one divided by 500 is 0 0.02. So this value decreases the further away Rayman is from his target. So now I can take the UI element scale and multiply it by this value, which will cause the UI element to shrink the further away Rayman is. Also, I need to multiply this by the transform scale of this image because of the pulsating animation. Otherwise, this formula would just override the scaling that comes from the pulsating animation, so no animation would be visible. Now for the arrow image, I scale it with a similar function, but that takes into account that there is no animation here. And then I get the arrow rotation. This is a function I made that gives me a rotation value for the arrow image to make it look like the arrows pointing from Rayman to its target. Let me get inside this function to explain how it finds the arrow's rotation. I'd say this is somewhat similar to what I've been doing in C++ to rotate Rayman in relation to the camera. Up here I use a dot product between a vector that's created from the target location to the player camera and the vector from the target to the player and I convert it to an angle value. So now instead of getting a value between minus one and one, I get a value between minus 90 and 90. Then I subtract this by 90, so the range is from negative 180 to zero. So that handles rotating the camera in one direction, but we still need to be able to rotate from zero degrees to positive 180. And that gets handled by this second dot product over here. This is a dot product between the vector created by the target's location subtracted from the player camera's location and the camera's right vector. Now I'm just interested in the sign value of this dot product, so whether it returns a positive value or negative value, since all I want to do here is just flip these values to be positive. So obviously I should have used the sign node here, I don't know why I made this little setup. However this does the same thing that the sign node does, so it just returns negative one or positive one. So now if I multiply these two values, I get a full range from minus 180 degrees to 180 degrees. And once that is handled, all is left is to swap the arrow images for the curved arrow images, depending on the player's velocity, player's Y velocity actually. So if the player is running right, we want the right curved arrow. If the player is running left, we want to change it to the left curved arrow. And if the player is running for forward then we want the straight arrow or if he's sta standing still. So the way I do this is I get the player's y velocity and compare it to his previous frame y velocity. I do this so I don't set the UI image every frame. I'm not sure how bad that is for, for performance. So this is kind of a check to see if we need to swap the image or not. So if they are not equal then we go to this compare flow where we compare the velocity y with zero. So if the y velocity is bigger than zero, we change the image to the right curved arrow image. If it's equal to zero, we change it to the straight arrow. And if velocity y is less than zero, we change it to the left arrow. And then at the end, I set velocity previous frame to be velocity y. So the next frame, we can compare it, the new velocity with the velocity from this frame. Okay, I hope I didn't make that too complicated. Now let's connect this thing to the Crab Ninja and see it in action. So to connect this, I add a widget class. Set the UI, set the widget class to the class we went over. I change the space to screen. And now I just gotta make the crab decide whether the widget should be visible or not, depending on if he's Rayman's current target. Doing this is very simple. 
I just get Rayman's chosen target and check if his chosen target is this crab and then just set the visibility based on that. However, I made the same optimization as last time to check if the vis UI visibility last frame was the same as this frame. I don't know if this is necessary, probably not, but I did it anyway. Okay, so if we fight him, the arrow switches as we move. And also the arrows pointing from Rayman to the crab. And let's not forget about this feature where the UI size scales nicely now. Now there's one more thing that's missing from the gameplay we analyzed in the previous video. And that's the words that spawn on the screen whenever you hit the enemy. Again, I took the textures from the original game as I think they look really cool. Here I have the material that I use for this particle system. I know it looks a little scary, but it really is very simple. The idea here is to get a number from the particle system and use that number to randomize between one of these five textures. So I have these if statements that compare the number I get from the particle system to this second number. And depending on which of these two values are bigger, the if statement returns one of these two values, so zero or one. So let's, for example, quickly analyze this lerp over here that if alpha is zero, we will have the first texture. And if alpha is one, we will see the, two, the second texture. So let's say, for example, that A is larger than B. That means that the value we got for the, from the particle system is larger than one. Then we feed in one into the lerp alpha. So the second texture will be visible. However, if the particle system gives us a value of zero, for example, then A is less than B. So if statement returns zero and plugs it into the alpha, making the first texture get displayed. And that's the whole logic behind this. The only thing I've done is layer a couple lerps and if statements on top of each other. So I don't randomize between two textures, but between five textures. However, I'm not gonna lie, this is pretty dumb in my opinion. <laughs> Later on in the project, I reminded myself that there exists something called flipbook animation, which goes pretty well with particle systems. A flipbook would be if I took these five textures and put them all on one single texture. Later on in the project, I have a flipbook particle system, so I'll go over that when we get there. But well, I guess if I ever need to randomize between textures and I for some reason can't use flipbooks, I have a way. Oh, one more important thing to note. In the material over here, I disable depth test. I do this so we have this word that spawns always in front of everything else. It makes it work more like some kind of comic book overlay than if it was actually in the scene. Okay, so for the particle effect, the particle gets spawned somewhere on a sphere. This dynamic material par parameter returns a random range float to randomize between, between different words. I have one scale sprite size over here that kind of makes the particle pop in and a scale color to make it kind of fade out over lifetime. Now, I have this user variable called damage taken that is used to drive the particle scale again. I do this because I wanted this particle to be larger if the enemy takes a bigger hit. So if we change the damage to three, as you can see, it's pretty big. And then we go back to one, it's a smaller. All right, crab guy doesn't stand any chances. Yes, I have been adding sounds in the meantime. I don't think I'm going to make any videos on that, however, because there's just nothing interesting to be said about adding sounds. The whole process boils down to me spending an hour combing through the Rayman sound files to find the one that I need and then just spawning it whenever something happens. So for example, here, when the enemy gets hit, you just spawn the sound at the enemy location. Okay. Thank you very much for watching. In the next one, I'm going to go back to 3D and talk about how I made the kind of starting area of the game, the one with the garden gnomes. Leave a like and subscribe if you had a good time and I wish you a wonderful day.